call the uh, work session to order, if you would. Mm -hmm. You mind calling rolling out? Mr. Wales? Here. Mr. Travis? Here. Mrs. Henry? Here. Uh, Mr. Harper is not here tonight. And Mr. Seibert? Here. We're present and one absent. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start off? I know we've got a presenter. Is that, um, is that, who, who's, who's actually giving that presentation? Are you giving? Okay. Well, you guys come on up and give us your name, and um, I think we've locked out 15 minutes for it, so. Good evening, Council. I appreciate y'all giving us the time and opportunity to speak with y'all tonight. Um, my name is Hunter Allen. I'm the electrical distribution engineer for Athens Utilities and Electric Department. Um, we want to talk to you and give you an overview of the AMI pilot project that we've been uh, working for this year um, that y'all approved in the council meeting in April. Um, we just want to give you a brief overview of where we are now, where we plan to be, and answer any questions that y'all have. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to James Gray. He's our AMI manager. Thank you. Hey, like you said, James Gray, AMI manager. I've uh, been with the electric department for 14 years. Was our professional geographer up until November 20 when we started this project. All right, what is AMI? It is Advanced Metering Infrastructure. And what that basically means is it's uh, smart meters that talk to a series of collectors, that talk to data management software that allows us two-way communications between us and the customer. So we're able to read, uh, connect, disconnect, and uh, collect a lot of data from the office. Uh, it has a lot of functions. Uh, some of the main ones we'll use it for is to make sure we're providing uh, quality electricity to our customers. We'll use it for outage restoration. It'll cut down on our uh, losses as far as theft is concerned because it uh, identifies tampering. And uh, it also is going to provide a lot of uh, services to our customers that they're currently not getting. All right, so we started a pilot six months ago with a company called Tanless. Uh, we put in 500 smart electric meters and two collectors in two different locations in the county. Uh, the installation went smooth and seamlessly. Uh, everything's working like it should. Those 500 meters are also reading around 200 water and gas meters that are equipped with a uh, radio ERT, which is some technology that we've invested in in the past to to read meters like you see them driving by and reading them with their handheld, these new meters will be able to pick up all those reads also. Uh, we uh, plan to build it all the way out for the entire system, which will be about 80,000 utility meters over the next four years, and that's with an estimated growth of 55 to 60 electric meters, 55 to 60,000 electric meters. We, uh, let's see, we looked at about half a dozen different companies. We picked Tantalist uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one of the main ones is their ability to read those ERTs. So as we install these smart meters, they'll start reading those radio read meters for us and uh, we won't be doing it manually anymore. Also, Tantalist has a big footprint in the TVA area. They uh, have multiple customers around us as close as Sheffield and Lawrenceburg. We've toured several of their uh, installations and talked to a lot of them, looked at where they're at and where they're going with it. Uh, Tanless brings back a lot of data that we're not currently getting now without having to manually go out and do it. And they are the only company that's licensed through ITRON to read those ERTs. So uh, there, there's no threat of that being stopped. This is just kind of a diagram of how it works. So. You put the smart meter in, there's a collector on a pole. Of course, you can't get line of sight from every meter to a collector, so the Tantalus system will bounce that reading from meter to meter until it finds its way back to the collector. The collector uses either cell phone or fiber technology to get that reading back to the office, and vice versa. When we send data out to that collector, it bounces it around and gets it to the meter that it needs to get to. And in the process, all those electric meters are also reading the water and gas meters that have radio reads installed. One of the questions we get a lot is, is it safe because you are putting an RF device on everybody's house? Uh, if you look at the chart, it's just barely more RF emissions than a Wi-Fi router. 
and a good bit less than a microwave or the cell phone that we use all the time. There's been studies, uh, especially with it being outside your house and not up against you, that they're completely safe. The customer benefits. Uh, the customers will see their data hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, however they want to look at it online, which now, you know, they get a bill once a month and without calling us, they don't know. Uh, we will be able to streamline our intervals. You know, sometimes you get a 35-day bill, sometimes you get a 28-day bill. We'll be able to streamline and you will always get a 30 or 31-day bill. You'll get automatic alerts if your power's out, whether you're home or not, it'll alert you that your house has lost power. Uh, you'll get alerts if it sees unusually high usage so that you can try to get ahead and fix a problem before you get a, a large bill. It, uh, let's see, with the reconnects and disconnects right now, you know, if you come home and your power's been cut off, you call for a reconnect, we had to roll a truck, you had to pay, it's a process. As soon as you pay, this meter will come back on. And so hopefully we'll be able to add ways to pay too. We already have worked on that with kiosk and online and IVR. So as that continues to grow, it'll be even easier for them to get reconnected. And uh, it also, once we get close to full deployment, we'll be able to offer some other ways to pay. Uh, a lot of utilities are utilizing prepay where you buy a certain amount of electricity. It'll send you alert when you're close to using it all. And then you can just get on there and buy more before you run out. And you know, some people would rather manage their money that way, so it'll give us an option to offer our customers that in the future. The utility benefits are a lot. Uh, we'll have instantaneous reporting of our power quality, so we'll know that everybody is in spec and that we're doing what we need to do. We'll have instant outage notifications. There'll be no guessing on waiting on calls to come in and sort through uh, messages or uh, automated calls. It'll lower the cost on reading the meters. Uh, as we go forward, there will be uh, staffing that won't have to be replaced. So we'll lower the cost of overhead there. And it'll also greatly lower that reconnect, disconnect cost by not rolling a truck every time somebody needs to be reconnected or disconnected. We can do it automated be able to monitor our voltage and frequency to ensure power quality. Uh, we do that now, but we have to go out and set a manual device to keep track on it. Of course, we know what it is at the substation, but to see where it is out in the field, we have to go out and manually check it, but we'll know every spot in the county at all times. Uh, it'll allow for us to change billing cycles if we need to without it being a big ordeal. If we need to add routes, remove routes, it won't be such a big ordeal like it has been in the past on how we read those routes. We will get all of those radio reads in the process. We spent a lot of money on radio reads. I'd say close to half of the electric meters right now have a radio and several thousand water and gas do too. So we won't be just throwing that infrastructure money out. We'll be reading those meters along the way with the new technology. Outage restoration is obviously a huge benefit. Right now, you call in your outage, you either speak to a dispatcher or the IVR. It takes that information and puts it into an electric model and shows us where you live and how we feed you. So until we get you know, the calls we need to see what's out, it, the outages can slowly build and we're not 100% sure what's out. We have an idea, but not exactly. When these meters go dead, the map will automatically populate. We'll know exactly what's out. It'll help our dispatchers to know if it, you know, if we need a small truck, if we need an entire crew, uh, and that'll make us more efficient on restoring outages. And it'll be safer too, because we'll know exactly what's out when we get out there to look at it. Let's see. Also, like with our cold weather situation we had a couple of weeks ago, we had to send people out to manually take taps offline so that when we pick it up, we don't get this huge inrush that could cause a larger, larger outage or even damage equipment. And with this, we can disconnect all the meters, we can pick up a, a feeder, and then we can add people on methodically to keep our people safer and our equipment safer and uh, pick up that cold load 
as we need to. So it would be very beneficial. This is a picture of the meter. Um, to the left, the little left of the display, the little thing sticking out there is the radio. To the right is a, a button. So let's say you want to be reconnected, but you're not home. You get an out, you know, you get a notification that you've been cut off for non-payment. You can go ahead and pay to be reconnected, and then that button will allow you to manually turn your power back on in case you you don't want to do it without you being home. We can automatically connect it and restore power to the house, <coughs> but if you don't want it to come on right then, we can restore it, and then as soon as you press that button, you, your house has power again. So you won't pull the meters anymore? There'll be no more pulling meters. Okay. If a meter is pulled, we'll get an alarm that's been tampered with. Got it. Okay. And that'll help us with the theft, you know. Yeah. And this is what the collector looks like. It's just the box on the pole that's got modems, routers. Uh, it's 4G technology. It can be on any carrier, whoever has the best service at that location. They're also fiber, so we will utilize the city's fiber network that we have now. And as we build that fiber network out, we will take them off the cell modems and put them on fiber, which will save us costs going forward in the future, not paying those data packages. But it's pretty much instantaneous with the 4G or the, obviously it's instantaneous with the fiber, but it's fast with the 4G too. And that's, uh, that's the gist of what we're trying to do. Well, let me, let me ask you something. Yes, well, sir. Will there still have to be a meter reader go straight by street? No, sir. Not when it's completely deployed. Where will they read the meter from? How, how, how far away? A mile or? Uh, it just depends. Uh, they, they jump from meter to meter to collector, so they can go a long ways. Um, we've got them as far away as at the high school, reading all the way over to Fraser Street with no problems, jumping through each other. But those collectors are also, they're set up to where we can add and move them as we need them. They're not hard to install. Anywhere we have power, we can put one. So if we're having a problem reading the area, we can add a collector if, you know, and if it's oversaturated with collectors, we can move them and, and, and save. So would you say that this program should, as we go, if we go forward with it, as meter readers become eligible for retirement and all that, they should not be replaced. Yes, sir. Because that's the meter's right. taking their job. Yes, sir, that's correct. I like that. Uh, has anybody done a, a cost analysis on this to see what it's costing us now for all the meter readers and trucks and hardware and software versus when we go to this? Is our consumers going to see the difference? Yes, we have done a cost analysis uh, for this project. Uh, we did one five or six years ago when we were close, and then we've done one now. Uh, I didn't put that in the presentation because I didn't know how bombarded we want to be with numbers, but I can get it to you. Uh, it does, of course, the farther the project goes, the greater the savings are. We also pay TVA a humongous demand charge every month, and with us being able to see all our voltages, we'll be able to greatly trim that demand charge so the electric department will see a cost benefit there and the potential of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And uh, I don't, I'm not really privy to how we bill our customers and if they'll see a direct savings, but you know how you want to look at everything on your phone, your bank account, your cell phone bill, you'll have all this, you'll have what you used today, what you used last week, what you used last hour you'll be able to see, hey, maybe my unit's going bad or maybe I just need to cut some stuff off or, you know, you'll be able to manage your own house a lot better. Yeah, I, I can see just from listening to your presentation, <coughs> there's a lot of points in it that I really like and I think most of the consumers will. But I dread the day when John Doe gets his utility bill after he sees he's got a, a meter like this and it's $100 higher. And I don't have to tell you, well, you got a meter now. That's We are going to find slow run meters. Into that. We will find slow meters. I mean, old meters don't read fast. They read slow. That's that's a fact. But that's also money that we're losing. We're set, we're buying that electricity and not selling it. So that's... If you talk to people in Coleman, Decatur, Madison, it's the same program. And how theirs is doing is 
They got the bugs worked out of it? We have. Uh, Sheffield's probably a year ahead of us on this exact project, so I've spoken to them a lot. Uh, we went all the way to Marietta, Georgia, who's a, a huge tanless user and uh, had a, a full day meeting, rode around, looked at their system and saw, uh, spoke to their meter room, their uh, clerks who, who use it to do the reconnects, disconnects and, and the whole department. We've looked at other companies that do the same thing and saw the benefits also, but as far as tanless, uh, That's good. Have. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. From a consumer standpoint, you said that they could track their use and that then they would be notified immediately when they have an outage. Is that yes. correct? Okay. So um, it would be up to them then to, I assume, download the app that they'd be able to access that sort of information and stuff? Yeah. We, okay. You know, we would want to put something in the bill that, you know, we mm -hmm. don't want to do it when we have 500 people because there's a lot of people that don't get to use it. But when sure. we get close to full deployment, we will advertise that you have these features now and explain how to use it. So that could potentially then do away with, hopefully, a lot of the calls that our utility office gets whenever we have an outage of well, you're gonna just have, people not wanting information. You're going people that aren't real tech savvy that don't want sure, to use it. But sure, obviously. All, you know, <laughs> everybody our age and younger that looks at everything on their phone is, mm -hmm. is going to utilize it. Okay. Now, from, and also from a consumer standpoint, what has been your feedback from City of Sheffield, other cities that have used that? Has there been satisfaction amongst their customer base? Yes, they say they love <laughs> the fact that they can get on there and see how much they've, mm -hmm. they're potentially spending before they get a bill. Okay, good. Nobody Thanks. likes surprise bills. <laughs> right? You don't want a $300 electric bill one month and a 600 the next month. You'd like to know what's coming. So, and to address what Mr. Wells was saying, once you have, let's say we're at full operation on the system, mm -hmm. and any malfunctioning meters, slow meters, all that stuff, kind of stuff, where we're essentially giving away product if they weren't billed for it correctly, right. then that's going to do away with the people who have the complaint of my bill was um, just randomly high this month. Well, so I mean, it, human, error, would be able to, human error happens. Meters right. get misread. That's that's sure. So it will do away with the misreads. Okay, cool. And we do spend money to go reread those meters. It's not free to drive somebody out there and reread it, so sure. it'll cut that cost back also. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. James, my only question is, uh, from from, your, from where you are right now to when it can and should be implemented, barring any unforeseen circumstances, how long are we, uh, how far out are we from implementing this? We'd like to be fully deployed in four years. Four years, yes, okay, sir. that's... Oh, that's, that's what I need to know. Okay. Thank you. I think it's very um, streamlined and uh, catching up with the times. And uh, I like the fact that, so if you have a water leak, this is going to give you some kind of indication <laughs> that you're using a lot more water than uh, water is expected. Department, yeah, they will be able to do leak detection that they can't do now. Yeah, those are things that you don't like to find out after the fact. So right. I think it makes a lot of sense. Does anybody else have anything else before we... So we're going to take a vote on it a little bit later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. In terms of uh, the rest of our meeting, we have a public hearing on uh, the property um, over on Pryor that we're developing as a park to adopt a master development plan uh, for that and then to follow an ordinance to rezone that property so that we can follow that plan. Um, does anybody have any questions about it? Uh, well, and I, I was threatened if I take my mask off, I was going to get kicked. Uh, my only, I have no problem with this, but I just want to reiterate that we're not giving, we're not financing anything. No, it's sir. It's just strictly a, uh, 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 rezoning. a rezoning issue. Yes, sir. Okay, so I just want that to be made clear. We're not. We're not approving, and yet we will not approve any money until some certain conditions are reached in other areas. So that's all I got to say. Yeah, the financing of this will be done over a series of a while. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, there's multiple phases to this yep. development, so you'll see it multiple times. What did you want to tell us about it, Matt? I'll just kind of go over why we're asking for the rezoning. 
this is going to be our first traditional plane unit development within the city. So the, the TPUD requires a mixture of traditional zoning districts. And the traditional districts in the city are kind of within a mile of the downtown area. And they focus more on the form of development rather than the use. So each traditional district, like this one's comprised of the TN3 and the TI districts, traditional institutional, they allow for multiple different forms of buildings, whether it be residential, commercial, office type, as long as it meets certain criteria that's built in to the zoning ordinance. So with this plan for the TPUD, it kind of narrows down exactly what's going to occur on the site. It specifically lists out the uses, you know, that the city's hoping to develop out there. It's obviously a public park first and foremost, but it's got several, several other elements built into it as well. So the TPUD master development plan allows us to have a little bit more flexibility with um, <coughs> the future design. However, it has to meet this master development plan requirement. If you can go up a couple more, Ken. So these are the uses that are being proposed. The public park, playground, splash pad, dog park, open area with pavilion, amphitheater, a singing river trailhead, a retail component, as well as a mixed use office retail component, several areas for public parking, and then a residential component along the western side of the property. But any substantial significant change to this would have to come back to y'all through an amendment process. So this kind of narrows down exactly what's going to happen on this property, whereas if we kept it as the current zoning districts, they do allow for all these uses. You know, we wouldn't need to do that. So it does provide for a little bit more clarity to the public about how this is going to develop in the future. It also includes a phasing plan, which is nice. So you can see how this is going to develop in the various phases. So we just want to point all that out. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? We've been talking about it a while, so. Uh, who will, thank you, Matt. Who will take uh, this ordinance? I'll take it, Chris. Is this something we've got to suspend the rules since it's an ordinance, I guess? We do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who will take that rule suspend? Okay. Uh, on the consent calendar, we have a resolution to appoint Einer, is it Einer? Is he here? NR. NR. Goodmanson <coughs> to the Athens Historic Preservation Commission for a three year term. We have a, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, item B is a resolution to set a public hearing for uh, the meeting on February 14th to request a, a rezoning uh, of two acres on Cambridge Lane uh, of the Athens East subdivision from B2 to R11 uh, and, and R112 institutional. Uh, then item C is a resolution to set a public hearing for the regular meeting at 5.30 on February 14th to review the request of Centerpoint Crossing Development to rezone 13.96 acres of property uh, located intersection of Athens Limestone Lane, Athens Limestone Boulevard from B2 to R2 and to adopt the master development plan. Item D is a resolution to set a public hearing for uh, the regular meeting at 5.30 on February 14th to request to review the request of Eugene Bettingfield and Corrine Bettingfield to rezone nine acres on 72 from R11 to in B2 to a B2. Uh, item E is a is another uh, public hearing uh, for that reg that same meeting on February 14th to review the request of Gobble Fight Lumber to rezone 35 acres of property located at West Market from R12 to R13, and then item F is a resolution to authorize the mayor's office to apply for a FY 2021 assistance to firefighters grant to fund the purchase of. P25 compliant communication equipment. So does anybody have any questions on any of these? The grant, uh, I got the match, so it's a, it's a pretty healthy match if we get it, but it's one of those we put in and if we get it, we get it, right? If there's no questions, who would who would take the consent calendar? You'll take it, Drew? Very nice. Okay. 
Item G is a resolution to approve uh, the purchase of this Tantalus system for AMI that we've just had a, uh, a good presentation on. You may have any additional questions on that. We've done a six month pilot and we just got the results of that six month pilot. Will the 2015 bonds, will they cover this cost? They will, but I would uh, suspend the rules on this anyway. Okay. I'll take the, I'll take the resolution. You'll take the ordinance? Yeah. Or the resolution, I'm yeah. sure. Okay, who will take the rules suspension on that? I'll take. Item H is a resolution to adopt a revised org chart for the police department to upgrade a sergeant slot into a lieutenant slot. <coughs> uh, Marsha, did you or Chief want to elaborate on that at all? This will uh, basically streamline our fourth shift. We started in November, if y'all remember, uh, our 12 hour shifts. So we went from three shifts to four shifts. And this will align the, the supervision on the fourth shift. Uh, the same as on the others. And what we're doing is taking one of the sergeant slots and just moving it into a lieutenant slot. So we'll be able to, uh, minimum cost uh, per year, and I think uh, we've got it in the budget um, already covered uh, due to field, unfilled positions. But that's, it's just a simple, it's just a management <coughs> thing. It's going, it makes it run smoother on mid shift. Okay. okay. Any questions? Anybody have any questions on that? Thank y'all. Yep, thanks, Chief. Who will take that resolution? I'll take it. Well, does that need a rule suspension? It doesn't. Doesn't? Okay. All right, do we have any ads? None that I'm aware of. Nothing to add to the agenda? Okay. All right, we will take four minutes and start the regular meeting. Thank you.
We'll go ahead and call the uh, call the meeting to order. The clerk, if you'd please call roll. Okay, Mr. Wales. Yes, here. Mr. Mr. Travis. Here. Mrs. Henry. Here. Mr. Harper is out tonight. Mr. Seibert. Here. Four present, one absent. Thank you. Yeah, if we would ask uh, our our absent people, it's kind of revolved around uh, with the council and the mayor. So we got the mayor out and uh, Councilman Harper and his wife out dealing with some sickness. So we would ask that you keep them as we've asked with uh, Councilman Wales and Councilman Travis, keep them in your prayers. Um, and hopefully the uh, the streak ends with those two because we've had, we've had a tough time getting everybody together. And uh, But just keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, pray for a speedy recovery. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, a word of prayer, and then uh, I'll lead the pledge, because we've got Mayor March down for that. Please bow, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. We uh, thank you for uh, everything that, that we enjoy here in Athens. Uh, we ask that you continue to look over us as we deal uh, like a lot of areas deal with sickness uh, this time of year and, and during this crazy uh, last few years. Uh, we ask that you continue to give us guidance and wisdom as, as we make decisions that we know impact our city and individuals. We ask that you give us both wisdom and courage in making those decisions. Uh, and we ask that you continue uh, to be with those in our community that are needy uh, and those that are impacted by everything we do. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice. All right, thank you. Uh, I would ask for a motion to approve the council and work session minutes, please. <coughs> Uh, would you please call roll on that and that? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. We don't have any special city council minutes nor standing committees or special committees, so we'll jump into the report of officers. City attorney, I skipped you last time. <laughs> Auburn's number one in basketball. Yep. Uh, Mr. Wales? Thank well, you, Auburn's number one in basketball. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget about reading about Auburn being number one. But more important thing, I'm proud to be here back. It's been a, it's been a long journey for me. Uh, I think I was maybe more scared than anybody in the family. But anyway, uh, things are beginning to turn around now, so I, I'm just proud to see every one of you. It's, uh, it's been a battle. Thank you. We're proud to have you back. Thank you. Mr. Travis? Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. I like uh, Councilman Harold. I'm glad to be here. I will tell you this. I am not dying from cancer. I'm living with cancer. I look good. I feel good. And that's the way it's going to be. All right. All right. I have a couple of things. One from the community. And thank you, Carolyn Williams, for this in 95. The Athens Limestone Community Association, the Black History Program for 2021, will finally preview uh, coming through the fire, the uh, surviving race and place in America. It's going to be held on February the 5th, uh, which is Saturday at 6 o'clock p.m. And I'm sorry, February, February the 5th at 6 o'clock p.m. and February the 6th at 2 o'clock p.m. at the Athens Cinema. It is absolutely free. But all the, all the yeah, coronavirus uh, protocols will have to be observed. So we want you to come, we want you to enjoy. I've seen this about 36 times, and I sit through it every time, okay? So it's great, it's about the life and times of Dr. Sierra Lincoln, who grew up here in the city of Athens and his contributions to the world after having to survive the things that he survived as a young boy here in Athens. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's not a, not a throwdown on Athens. It's, it's really a compliment to Athens and all the things that uh, Dr. 
Eric Lincoln was able to accomplish as, as a as a uh, opportunity to grow up here. I'm sorry, I got winded. Um, the other thing is the $500,000 uh, community grant for the Vine Street Project. We're so happy and so thankful if, for anybody that thinks, okay, they got a half million dollar grant for Westview, for Westmoreland, for Vine Street, those people have had to put up with intolerable conditions for years. And finally, something positive is going to be and can be done about that. So we're so happy to, uh, to know that and to, to get that ball rolling. And it's going to be great. It's going to take a few years to get it all done, but we're very grateful for that. My only other thing is, had we passed uh, Resolution C last, when, the last time we had a meeting, I would have been walking on cloud nine. Because as you know, most of the paving list had to do with uh, the streets in District 3, especially Bellevue and out in that area. And uh, these people have put up with patching and drainage issues for years. And so I just want the council to know that it's not on, a, it's not on the uh, agenda tonight, but whenever it comes up, we ain't backing down. Thank you so much. Right. And we're happy to have you too, Councilman Trev. Yes, we are. Councilman Hill. Okay, why do you always put me after Frank? <laughs> like I can, you know, top that. It is good to have Mr. Wells and Mr. Traps back. And um, t uh, Chocolate Walk tickets go on sale tomorrow. So go uh, buy your ticket, <clears throat> hang out uptown, visit the merchants around the square and then go and see the movie because you really do need to see it. Uh, I had the opportunity to watch it with the members of the Mayor's Youth Commission about a year ago, I yeah. guess. And it was very moving. It was beautifully done. Y'all did an amazing job. And it was very gratifying to see the reaction of our uh, NYC members. So if you have not had an opportunity to watch it, go. And, um, you know, you can have our little chocolates to munch on while you watch. So, thank you. Thank you. And I would echo the, uh, the comments about both of those and the grant. Um, I'm hoping it's going to have a similar impact to what it's had in that AES uh, area. It really made a difference over there in terms of drainage. So, uh, we expect it to do the same in, uh, in the area that we've just been awarded. So, uh, with that, we will jump into our regular meeting. Uh, first on the docket, we have a public hearing for the proposed rezone of 31.7 acres of property located at the northwest corner of Pryor and Boardwalk Main Street from a traditional institutional and TN3 to a TPUD and to adopt the master development plan for Pryor Park within the corporate limits of the city of Athens. So we'll, we'll open the public hearing and um, start off with Matt. Yes, sir. Matt Davidson, city planner with the SNCD division. Um, the city is proposing to redevelop this property, which is a little over 30 acres, for a public <coughs> park. But there are multiple elements to this plan, and we are requesting to rezone this from a traditional institutional and traditional neighborhood three district, which it currently is, to a traditional plan unit development to allow this to be approved to a master development plan, which will kind of nail down exact, the exact uses of the property and the layout of it. Of course, future development will come back through various approval processes, and this has nothing to do with any type of funding mechanism for this park. This is just the zoning. And the current zonings of this property actually permit all of the uses that are being proposed, but the TPUD master development plan will show you exactly where these uses will occur and will also provide for a phasing of these uses. Uh, the Planning Commission met on this back in November and did recommend approval and staff is also recommending approval of the request. I'm available for any questions. Can I have any questions before he has a seat? All right. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody else would like to come up and speak, uh, we'll say for this. Come up. You've got three minutes. Uh, just give us your, your name and your address. Anybody like to come up and speak on behalf of this for it? If you might like to speak against it. 
Feel free to come up. You've got three minutes, and same deal, just give us your name and your address. Scott Marshall, 212 East Street. I'm not against it. I'm wanting to find out some clarifications. If, if y'all vote this in, mm -hmm. the people that are, surround that area, including myself, Will they ever have an opportunity to voice their opinion of what goes on in the, in the different phases that are being completed? You know, this is, this is not a one-year project. This is many years, many phases. There's res residential and retail that are proposed, but I've yet to see anything that's like guidelines of what can be residential and who, who's putting the residential in. Is, or the city people, or are we gonna lease that property to somebody? Or how is that being defined? Mm -hmm. And if we vote on it tonight and approve it, can that ever be changed? The zoning? If, if, if somebody, if, they, if we proceed on with just like it's designed and somebody objects to how it's going, mm -hmm. can it be changed? The zoning can be changed by us, we can always Used to rezone it, but, uh, but uh, who, when it comes to residential, let's let's take for example, right now we look like we we've, we've been told it's going to have high end residential. Let's say if times change mm -hmm. and it's not going to be high end residential, but somebody just comes in and says we're just going to put residential. Who has to say of that? It's already been approved. We're going to put residential in, but who has to say of no? That's not how it was presented to us. Matt, there's you, no real guidelines of yeah. what it's going to be yeah. and what kind of re I mean, we have a good picture of the different retails, yeah. but what can be there, what are, is proposed to be there. Matt, why don't you speak, you mean you're more qualified to speak to the process by which different things will be phased in. So obviously this property is going to have to be subdivided as it develops. So there will be a platting process just like every other subdivision where it goes through the Planning Commission and does have a public hearing to discuss how the property is being subdivided. And at that time, the specific uses for like the residential, for example, will be discussed. Um, we don't have an end user in mind for the residential. Obviously, the city, we're not residential builders, mm -hmm. but the, it, the property will have to be sold. So the transfer of the property will go through a public hearing process as well. So there'll be a selection, I'm sure, of whoever the builder is and what product that they offer. And the same will go with the retail as well. We're not retail developers. Yeah. So there'll be an interview process with that and a selection process with that as well. And then all non-residential non development will have to go through a site plan review and meet all the you know, city's requirements for site plan approval. Okay. Does that well, answer your question, Scott? Yeah, so, I mean, we've I've got a question for him, if you don't mind, Mr. Sure. Uh, let's say it is approved tonight. And, it, and in, like the gentleman just spoke of, causing for high-end apartments. Mm -hmm. Okay, when they bring the, their plat in for you to look at, you and your department, you're going to be able to see it right then. Hey, these are not high-end apartments. These are just run-of-the-mill apartments. Will you be able to call their hand on that at that point? Yes, it'll be going through a public hearing process, and we'll be able to call that out. We'll ask for specific building elevations, what the product type's going to look like. Um, these, the current zoning districts allow for townhomes, duplexes, quadplexes, detached single family homes, condos. So none of those uses are outside of what is already allowed on the property. We don't know what that end product's gonna be yet out here. It's kind of what the market demand will be, but we know we want it to be of a higher end type. So that's something that we're gonna look at when this comes through the subdivision process. And also with the site planning too, when it comes to the non-residential components. Good. So just like it, most of these, they, they go th through the planning commission. And yep. There's several checks and balances that go with this. I mean, yeah, bottom line, we've, we've got a big piece of property that we took down, a nasty facility, and mm -hmm. uh, we've paid a couple of different agencies to take input from a lot of stakeholders, and they've proposed a plan. Then we paid a, uh, a different group to even further refine that plan, and that's kind of where we are, yep. right? That's where, that's where we're at. All right, thanks, Matt. Does that answer your question, Scott? Perfect. Right. Yep, come on, just give us your name and your address, if you would. My name's Milton Legg. I live at 112 MacArthur Drive, and I back up 
to this to this sweet soup property and um, one thing that we talked about in the in all the series of meetings that we had mm -hmm. was that if there was to be any residential development down there we would prefer that it to be single family housing and I don't know where in the conversation you know when when this series of plans got put together there were no series of meetings for input on those it was just kind of put together and uh, we would certainly as as neighbors out there prefer that it not be multifamily housing but that it be single family housing we just feel like that's much better for our property values, uh, for our community, et cetera. Okay. Right. And I don't know whether now this is set in stone or whether uh, when this comes up as far as selling the property, will the city dictate to the developer how they have to use the property or you know, will we have any input at that point? At that point when it sold? Yeah. Yeah. In other words. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it's when it, and by one even after it's sold, when it's when it's uh, a proposal. Well, yeah, but made. once it's sold, I mean, it's it's a done deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you don't get it on the front end, it's not going to yeah. happen. We all know that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, if is it a steamroller now, or 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 is it too late to? Okay. But will we as neighbors have any input to the city as, as, as far as, uh, you know, when you sell it to XYZ developer, uh, I assume you're going to say, this is, what we, this is what we have in mind. Will there be a, a um, set in stone, you have to develop this as single family, you have to develop, yes. develop this as multifamily? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. That concludes the public hearing. Councilman Wales. Mr. President, now therefore be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Athens, Alabama, as follows. At an ordinance to rezone plus or minus 31.7 acres of property located at the northwest corner of Pryor Street and Broadwalk Main Street from T1 Traditional Institution and TN3 Traditional Neighborhood 3 District to TPUD Traditional Plan Unit Development and to adopt a master development plan for Pryor Park within the corporate limits of the city of Athens, Alabama. Can we get a motion to suspend the rules, Councilman Travis? Our motion we suspend the rules. Can we get a roll call on that, please, Annette? Mm -hmm. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. And please a second on Councilman Wales' ordinance. I'll second it. All right. Can we get a roll call on that as well? Mm -hmm. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero <coughs> nays. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is reading of petitions, applications, complaints. This is uh, your opportunity from the audience if you want to come up and address the council. Uh, again, you'll be given three minutes and just give us your name and your address, please, if you would. If anybody would like to come up. All right, we will move on. Consent calendar, Councilwoman Henry. Be resolved by the City Council of the City of Athens, Alabama to appoint N.R. Goodmanson to the Athens Historic Preservation Commission for a three-year term expiring January 24, 2025. Be it resolved 
again by the City Council of City of Athens, Alabama, to set a public hearing for the regular meeting at 5.30 p.m. on February 14, 2022, to review the request of Chris Wood and Amanda Kaufman to rezone plus or minus two acres of property located at 14286 and 14302 Cambridge Lane, lots five and six, of the Athens East subdivision from B2 General Business District to R11 Low Density Single Family Residential District to INST Institutional District within the corporate limits of the City of Athens, Alabama. Also to set a public hearing for the regular meeting at 5.30 p.m. on February 14, 2022, to review the request of Center Point Crossing Development, <clears throat> LLC, to rezone plus or minus 13.96 acres of property parcel number as follows, located at the intersection of Athens Limestone Lane and Athens Limestone Boulevard from B2 to R2 Multifamily Residential District, and to adopt the master development plan within the corporate limits of the City of Athens, Alabama. Also, to set a public hearing for the regular meeting at 5.30 p.m. on February 14, 2022, to review the request of Eugene Beddingfield and Corinne Beddingfield to rezone plus or minus nine acres located at 22201 U.S. Highway 72 from R11 to B2 and B2 to B2 within the corporate limits of the City of Athens. Also, to set a public hearing for the regular meeting at 5.30 p.m. on February 14, 2022, to review the request of Go Bull Fight Lumber Company to rezone plus or minus 35.21 acres of property located at West Market Street and Lucas Ferry from R12 to R13 within the corporate limits of the city of Athens, Alabama. Is that it or I have another one? I had to stop and read, sorry. Uh, also, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Athens, Alabama, that the Mayor's Office is authorized to apply for a fiscal year 2021 assistance to firefighters grant to fund the purchase of P25 compliant communications equipment. If approved, the grant would fund 90% of the purchased cost, the federal grant portion being $130,746.55 with a local match of $13,074.65. Thank you. Can we get a second on those? Second. Now, would you please call the roll on that? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. Item G, Councilman Travis? Yes, item G. I lost my place. I'm speaking to the microphone. The electric department has recently completed a six-month pilot evaluating the, the Tantalus Systems uh, AMI Advanced Metering Infrastructure System. The pilot consists of the installation and evaluation of over 500 electrical meters to ensure that remote readings could be obtained and entered into the utility billing system without the need to perform any of the functions manually. A successful evaluation was made to determine that the gas and water meters outfitted with electronic uh, modules could also be read and entered into the system. Tantalus Systems Incorporated provide the specifications and pricing structure that is most attractive for the electric department and is the only provider capable of reading a large number of existing electric meters on the electric system along with gas and water meters. Electric meters and, and, and collectors installed for the pilot will remain in place as the basis for overall system de deployment. The cost of the Tantalus System Incorporated AMI system deployment is 1,519,780, I mean, 1,519,000, five, one <laughs> and covers cost and installation of equipment, software, license, and project management. Funding for this project will be paid out of the 2015 bond process obtained for the purpose. So be it resolved for the City Council of the City of Athens, Alabama, to approve purchase from Tantalus System Incorporated and AMI System Equipment Software and Project for the cost already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we get a motion to suspend the rules? Motion to suspend the rules. Second. We get roll call on the rule suspension, please. Mr. Wales? 
Yes. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. And then a second to Councilman Travis. Second. Can we get a roll call on that, please. Mm -hmm. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mrs. Henry? Yes. And Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. And then item H, Councilman Wales. Mr. President, be resolved by the City Council of the City of Athens, Alabama to adopt the attached revised organization chart for the police department to upgrade a sergeant slot and into a lieutenant slot. All right, can we get a second on that? Second. Now, would you please call the roll? Mm -hmm. Mr. Wales? Yes. Mrs. Henry? Yes. Mr. Travis? Yes. Mr. Seibert? Yes. Four yeas, zero nays. Uh, I don't think we have any other items of business. Okay. Well, that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Meeting is over. Good job. Yep. Uh -huh. Well, it, the uh, yeah.